Okay, we're in, we're in part four, chapter five, which is a, a chapter on prayer. And I gave some introduction to the ideas yesterday. And I want to, I want to add two, two uh, more, two more features to what I, to what I said yesterday. Now, I made a point yesterday of saying that the prayers are corresponding to the sacrifices. That's a quotation from Tractate Brachos in the Babylonian Talmud. Corresponding. <coughs> and I made the point that prayer, our order of prayer was established by the men of the Great Assembly at the beginning of the Second Temple. So that prayer and sacrifices went hand in hand for 420 years. So to think of prayer being established to replace the missing sacrifices is just historically a mistake. Furthermore, I pointed out that the verse in Isaiah and Solomon's dedication of the temple when he built it, both of them identify the temple as a place of prayer. So um, again, the idea that it's just invented to replace the missing sacrifices is, is nonsense. Nevertheless, at the end of this chapter, the Ramchal writes the words that by reciting the prayers, we replace the missing sacrifices. Now, if you'll hang around here for a while and learn to pay careful attention to words, you'll notice that I just changed the formulation. I started by saying three times the idea that the prayers were invented to replace the missing, to make up for the missing sacrifices. They were invented for that purpose. That's what I said three times. Now I said something else. I said, when you pray, that, that makes up for the missing sacrifices. Those are two different statements. One is the purpose for which they were made, and the other is a function that they have post facto. And as a matter of fact, the Shulchan Aruch, which antedates the Ramchal by several hundred years, the Shulchan Aruch writes that the prayers are in place of the sacrifices. Now, usually, later works quote from the Talmud, and they quote the Talmud verbatim. As I told you, that's not what's written in the Talmud. The answer is this. You start off with a compound institution. You have the sacrifices running from Moses' time with their laws. Now comes a time when you want to establish a certain structure, time, period, frequency of prayers, and you model that on the structure of the sacrifices because going back to Solomon, we know that prayer and sacrifices go hand in hand. So now we're establishing that they should go hand in hand. Now you have a compound institution. Two features working together to jointly produce an effect. I'll explain how the joint works in a minute. Now, you have these two resources, both working together to produce the effect. Suppose you would lose one of the two resources. Then you might say, well, from now on, we have to hobble along on crutches, and the single remaining part of the joint institution, that will have to do double duty. It'll have to do, it'll have to function for the compound because the other half of the compound is missing. And that's what's meant in the Shulchan Aruch and the Ramchal when they say that praying today stands in for the sacrifices. There used to be a project which was addressed by prayers and sacrifices together. Now the sacrifices are missing. So as a stand-in, what you have left is the prayers. And the prayers have to somehow function in place of the compound. It's a remainder functioning in place of a compound, not something that was invented to replace the thing that was already missing. Those are two entirely different pictures. Uh, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. You know, you're going to play baseball with some friends. Each team is supposed to have nine members, and your team comes with seven. 
you don't want to play? So you say, we'll do it. You know, we'll play without a shortstop, and uh, we'll let you put your catcher behind, we'll give it up, and we'll play with seven in place of nine. The seven are going to do the work of the nine. They're going to play even though it's a subset. Or there's going to be a, a, a performance of an opera with a, an orchestra and a choir, and the choir makes it, but the orchestra doesn't make it. So people are irate and they want their money back. And the owner of the theater says, I tell you, we, we gotta, we've got a way to fix it. We have a guy who knows to play the piano, and he has a score for the opera. He'll play the piano. Now, piano isn't an orchestra. We understand that. But choir plus piano will have to do the job that was done by choir plus orchestra. They'll just have to stand in for it. So that's what's meant by saying it's, it's in place of. It's the a component doing the work of the compound. Um, and now, I'm not going to do this in detail. It is a chapter of my book. But um, sacrifices are, in some sense, presenting something of ours for God. OK, it's not really ours and so forth and so on. But that's the flow. We're presenting something to God in, God's, in the place where God's presence dwells. In prayer, we also offer ourselves to God not animals and wine and oil and fine flour and water, but ourselves. And prayer was going on from the time of Abraham. It wasn't institutionalized, but it was going on. And now the rabbi said, we want an institutionalized participation of the whole of the Jewish people in this national sacrifice. So that while the, the, the uh, priests are offering the sacrifice in the temple, Jews everywhere are praying to God to join in this compound institution. Since, as I mentioned yesterday, the title of this building is Base Tefillah, a house of prayer. That's its title. Even though the activity you think of as, as sacrifices, but the title of it is Base Tefillah, the house of prayer. So said King Solomon. So that's what, what the Ramchal means uh, in, in terms of uh, when he says this replacement. I, I want you to understand this. That would contradict what I said yesterday. Also, he says elsewhere, when he's talking about this situation capitalistically, and there's something very important to learn here. Now, the Ramchal started out with his life in Italy, so he has a kind of Sephardi um, organization of prayer. And the way it's organized is this. The first section is reciting laws of sacrifices. The second section is based on psalms, psukhi de zimra, with other associated material, but the heart of it is psalms. The third section is the, is the, is the shema, with its associated blessings. This is like rungs in a ladder going up. The fourth section is the amidah, the shema esrei, the silent prayer, which we told you when you talk about prayer in, 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 in our uh, vocabulary, prayer or tefillah means the silent prayer specifically. That's the top of the ladder. That's the, so to speak, the goal of the effort. Then on the other side, coming down, you have Asher Uvel which in a certain sense corresponds to Shema. Then in this order, which is the Sephardi order, you have the Psalm of the Day, which corresponds to Psukhi de Zimra, which is Psalms. And finally, you have the, rest, the recital of the incense offering, which corresponds to the description of the offerings, which is the first section of the prayer. So it's a seven-piece, seven-unit structure, three on the way up, the top, and three on the way down. And the ones up and down on the same level correspond to one another. You will notice I've left something out, right? Left out Aleinu. Aleinu l'shapeach l'adon hakol. That is not part of the prayer. It's not part of the prayer. It's the postlude upon leaving the synagogue. It's a meditation that you have when you break off and, and, and go. One indication of this is that on Shabbos, <coughs> when in the morning we have two prayers, we have Shachris and Musaf, we don't say Elena in between. Somehow we manage without Elena in between. We don't say Elena at the end. 
there are those who say alien in between. Yes, yes, but a tiny minority that they do. But for the vast majority, we don't because nothing's missing from the prayer if you don't say alenu because it's not part of the prayer. It's a meditation that has a different purpose. Now, in Kabbalistic terms, there are, in our region of the, of the world, four worlds. There are other worlds beyond the four worlds, and the worlds have sub-worlds. It's more complicated kind of system. But there are four worlds, so to speak. I'll explain the so to speak in a minute. And the worlds correspond to the levels of prayer bottom to top. So the first section of prayer, which is reciting the sacrifices, corresponds to the lowest world. The Psalms to the next highest. Shema to the next highest. And Shema Nesri to the highest. And the description of the process is your first section that you recite of the, the laws of sacrifices, you're taking the lowest world and attaching it to the world above it. Number four to number three. When you say the Psalms, you're attaching world three to world two. When you say Shema, you're attaching world two to world one. Now everything's attached from bottom to top. When you address the top, world one, what you're trying to do is justify a flow from that world downwards. Your prayer at that point should justify that flow. Then you accompany the flow downwards to the, on the, on the coming down, which is actually the Sun, which is corresponding to Shema, and the Shir Shal Yom, which corresponds to the Psalms, and the Ketoros, the incense, which corresponds to the sacrifices. You're following the flow down. Okay, that's the procedure. Now, this raises a question. You want to have a flow from the top going down. Why do it that way? Why not start at the top? Start at the top. Address the top, justify, justify a flow, and then come down to, the, the top is number one, go down to number two and attach it to number one, so the flow can go down to two. Then go down to three and attach it to two, so the flow can go down to three. And then go down to four and attach it to three, so the flow can go down to four. Why not do it that way? Why do all the attaching first before you address the top? Just, you, you get there because, because of the job you have to do. Not, not as if you don't have access. From the point of view of this of description of this procedure, my goal is to engineer a flow from the top to the bottom. Are you climbing up the ladder yourself? To bring Maybe so, but that's not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the, uh, justifying the flow. Right? That's, that's the only part of the project that we have to, talked about. So the Kabbalists say something very important here. The whole purpose of the flow is to get to the bottom. The top is looking at the bottom. Oh yeah, there's a way to go to get to the bottom. But the whole purpose of the flow is to get to the bottom. If the flow will go from one to two and stop there, it's worth less. Zero. Epis. Nothing. Nothing's been accomplished. So if you haven't attached the bottom to the top, so the flow is ready to go all the way to the bottom, there's no justification for the flow. Justification has to be that the, that the structure is fully engaged so that the top can project to the bottom. This is a very important point. Um, there, are, there are names for the various elements in the, in the, in the ladder. The top, letter, the top uh, element is called, it has 16 names, but one of the names is Keser, which means crown. And the bottom is called Malchus, which means kingdom. And in certain of our liturgy, the phrase Keser, Malchus, applies which would mean you're taking the top and attaching it to the bottom direct with nothing in between. That's the goal. The goal is to get from top to bottom. The two features that need to be in play are the top and the bottom. The in-between ones have the function of making sure it gets from the top to the bottom. They don't have independent function. That's a very, very important uh, uh, principle. We spoke already about the fact that what we do here depends on what's going on there, right? So this is, this is an illustration of it. And you have exactly the same thing in tefillin. Because the tefillin are associated with three parts of the body, as you probably know. The arm, the heart, because the, the box of tefillin on the arm is, is corresponding to the heart. <coughs> and on the head. Now, the flow from above flows from to the head, from the head to the heart, from the heart to the, to the, to the limbs. There's understanding and there's 
will, and then there's roughly, and then, and then there's the body carrying it out. So the flow is definitely to head, from head to heart, and heart to arm. Why then do we put the fill on our arm first? And put the fill on the head second. If the flow is going to be down, put the fill on the head first and draw the, 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 the flow down to the head and then put it on the arm and draw it down the rest of the way. Same answer. If it isn't ready to go down to the arm, it's not coming to the head. Not coming to the head. Not getting it. That's why we speak about lomed amenas lasos. You learn Torah in order to do. If it's an independent intellectual pastime, it's, it's certainly not worth what Torah is worth, and it could be even worthless, worthless depending upon how you do it. It's lilmod amenas lasos. That has to be the inner content of the learning. Not only amenas lasos, or lasos could be broadly interpreted as doing the mitzvah of Talmud Torah also. But... Uh, but, but if that's not part of the inner content of the learning, then the learning is, is not fun, do, is serving its function. So at any rate, this is, this is a crucial, a crucial il illustration of the way in which these flows take place. There's one more illustration that I want to mention. This has a hundred illustrations. And this is in time. Um, if you sing L'Chadodi, one of the phrases in L'Chadoidi is Sof ma'aseh b'machshavah t'chila Last in action first, uh, first in thought Last in action First in thought What is that? These words describe A ubiquitous category One that we're working with all the time a Very important category And that is Means to ends Let's imagine someone who has decided at age 13 that he wants to be a doctor. If he's a serious person, he'll start thinking. Say, I want to be a doctor. Hmm. Well, that means I've got to go to medical school. Okay. Hopefully a good medical school. Well, to go to medical school, I've got to go to a college that has a good pre-med program. Like Johns Hopkins, where I used to teach. Uh, now... Okay, but i got to get into Johns Hopkins. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm 13. I'm going to high school. I better take science courses in high school. I better be good at that. I better be, work at the science fair in the summers, you know, where they have spe special projects, especially in biological uh, type uh, of projects, so that they'll be interested in me as part of a pre-med program. So what has he done? He started with his goal, which he's going to get to last, and he worked backwards through the means to the goal till he comes to something which he at 13 can do. Now he carries it out in action. 13, he goes to high school and does his program in high school. From there he gets into Johns Hopkins and he gets his pre-med degree. From there he goes to medical school, graduates and does residency and becomes a doctor. So the, thought, the, the position of being a doctor is the first thing he thought of and the last thing that he does. Sof ma'aseh, machshava t'chila. That which is last in action is first in thought. That's the definition of a goal. Now, for those who know some philosophy, this now becomes a little controversial. As I usually say, the only thing I can uh, uh, say about the ideas I'm going to tell you is that they're true. And if people disagree, they're wrong. Um, think of the mental set of the person who's going through the process. He wants to be a doctor, he traces it all the way back, he goes to high school, he does the summer high school, uh, uh, su summer projects and so forth and so on. But, in the, mean, in the middle of the means, he's still being guided by the end. He hasn't forgotten the end. And for example, let's suppose, halfway through high school, Johns Hopkins' status as a pre-med program goes down. And UCLA goes up, then he'll say, well, I've got to change my mind. I'm not going to John Sox, I'm going to UCLA. Because the goal um, directs his activities in getting to the goal. The end is having an impact on the means. You tell me that that's the later affecting the earlier? Yeah, that's right, it is. 
in, in, in intentional action that happens all the time. So that the, 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 the idea of the goal is guiding the means actively all the time. And that's, this, again, the same idea that the, the higher, the more precious, the, the more intrinsically valuable, has a con constant connection with the nitty-gritty nitty means that are taking place, the ones which could be discarded if the circumstances change and you don't need those means. You know, it used to be, uh, I'm going back a long time because I'm very old, it used to be four years in, in undergraduate school and then four years in medical school. And then some schools became very clever and they said, we have a six-year program. You can get your undergraduate degree and your medical degree in six years. You just collapse the program. Oh, I'm not going to these schools anymore. I'm going to six year program. I need two more years of two more years of debt for college expenses and all the rest. So you change because the goal is guiding your actions in the midst of the means of getting there. It hasn't been abandoned. It hasn't been, it hasn't been put, you know, put aside for 20 years. These are all examples of how the higher thing, the, the more precious thing, reaches all the way down to the the lowest level and, and is guiding and managing the lowest level so that it will serve the purposes of the, of the highest. Yeah? Could we make an analogy with the netherim? Like how a nether somehow flows from a higher idea that we have and then uh, shapes the way we do things? You're talking about a nether, I mean an oath. A nether, yeah. I, I think what I'm describing now is typical of all uh, intelligent design of all intentional action. Intentional action starts with a goal and then it chooses a means to the goal. Indeed, this is another subject which I've talked about in other contexts, the definition of action includes a purpose. You see someone's body move in a certain way and you say to him, why did you do that? And he says, wrong question. Why is it the wrong question? Because there was no purpose. There was no purpose in what happened. Well, then it wasn't an action. It was a twitch. The idea of an action has a purpose built in, even if the purpose was just to do that. Right? If he's painting a picture, he says, what's your purpose in doing that? So I'm painting a picture. My purpose was to paint a picture. But to say that the question is irrelevant, it's not a re relevant question, that means you're dis disavowing the category of action altogether. So human beings act in terms of purpose all the time. And then there's a, there's a relationship between the purpose and the means, if there is a separation like that. And then the means, the purpose is going to guide the use of the means. This is built into, it's built into human life because purpose of action which is redundant the way I'm describing it, action is uh, a great part of human life. Yeah. I think it makes, it fits in, at least I, way from Rosh Hashem Pinkus, he explains that the attribute of Malthus is the actualization of potential, or so that when it brings down the lowest level, Kesser to Malthus, it's, it's making it, it's uh, putting it to action. The goal, the actualization. Well, I, I didn't see Rabbi Pinchas inside, and um, when you say that Malchus is the actualization of potential, I'm not sure which potential it means. Where there's the a the last one is, is uh, Malchus. Oh, so it's that in of itself, there's no real thing. The Melech, his his benefit, his is putting into action. He's 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 in a position to make sure things take place. And that's the meter of, of Malthus. So okay, the idea, that, the idea of a king is one who actualizes things. That's true. He's hands-on the executive. But I'm not sure that the right description for... Great idea. Turn off the air conditioning. Uh, I'm not sure the right description for the higher levels here is just potential. That's well, too weak. Not potential, but uh, meaning the thought. Is the but you said, what you said was potential. It's actual, actual, actualizing potential, right? I don't think the right me word for the higher levels is potential. They are active. They are active principles. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that the word potential is not going to be too helpful there. Yeah. I have a question. Um, sometimes it gets a little bit difficult to differentiate between what the 
uh, goal is and what are the means. Right? We might have talked about this before a little bit, but um, sometimes like you might think like, oh yeah, I want to be a doctor or something. But that's just like, you know, in the process of me becoming, I don't know, on my journey closer to God, I need to get a parnasa and I need to do this. Uh, but maybe that's where I need to end up. Like, it sometimes gets a little skewed. How do we differentiate sometimes when it's like very confusing? Okay, I don't know. You, you raise a general question, then you're, you're giving a, a, a specific example. I'm not quite sure how the two relate, but let's start with the general example. I think this is very, very important. When you're engaged in a process, <coughs> it's extremely important to keep straight what are the means and what are the ends. And indeed, prior to that, when you're doing anything, you ought to ask what are the ends, especially when you're doing something that somebody else told you to do, even if it's the Creator told you to do it. He wants you to investigate what the ends are. And I think that people often miss it. They don't get the, the, the right answer to this question. So, for example, uh, if you ask people, mitzvos, commandments, what purpose do they serve? In general, all of them. Sometimes you get the answer, <clears throat> purpose? They don't serve a purpose. They're what you have to do, because the Creator wants you to do them. You do them because they are commandments, period, end of story. They don't serve a purpose. And that means to something else. Turns out that's dead wrong. That's dead wrong. The Zohar calls the 613 commandments 613 strategies. A strategy is a procedure whereby you get something else. If you're just repeating the strategy over and over again, you don't know where it's going, you don't care, and you don't arrive at it, what you're doing is worthless. By the way, some people want to define a fanatic as someone who forgets what the goal is and when his efforts don't bear fruit, he just tries harder. <laughs> What's the goal? Now, those who have been with me from the beginning of, of the Derech Hashem. What's the goal of doing mitzvahs? Yeah, they become attached to the, to the Creator. Every one of them is a, is a means to that end. They're all means. If you forget that, if you're so wound up in the mechanics of the performance that you forget what the purpose of it is, then you're lost. You're lost. So, um, the, the, the idea of keeping the, the, I mean, this is, what you're asking really is a, it's just a, another expression of what I've been saying. Now you're applying it to conscious, conscious life. Keep the goal in your head. Keep the goal in mind. Mm -hmm. This has many, many applications. You're going to have an interaction with somebody. Sometimes your interactions with this person are tense. You know, there's a certain amount of aggressiveness and competition there or, or a certain amount of critique there. One good uh, method is to ask yourself beforehand, when I walk out of that interaction, what do I want to have accomplished? If you think about that question, you may find that you have to undergo a wrenching transformation because what's driving you to go there is, I'm going to get him. <laughs> I'm going to get him. I know where his weak spots are. I know how to defeat him. And it's going to be in public. I'm going to drag him down. That's what I'm going to do. Really? Uh-huh. That's what you're going to do? And when you walk out and you're patting yourself on the back, is that what you want to have accomplished? To make him feel bad? To make him look bad? to make them afraid of you and hate you and want to drag you down? Are you really better off if that's what the outcome of the interaction is? You stop and think, what goal do I want to achieve? And then you try to program yourself so that when you go into the interaction, that goal is influencing how you behave. Sometimes we, don't, we just don't pay attention to what the goal ought to be. Okay, so this is, this is a lot of... Uh, of applications of the, of the same idea. I, I think that in general what you said is right. Okay, those are the things that I wanted to add to the idea of prayer. Now, the next section 
deals with a lot of deep metaphysics, and I don't think I can usefully explain it, especially since we have only a week to go, and I'd like to get to the end of the, and so the last sections of the, of the book. Um, but he does mention here the idea of talus and tefillin. Now, I didn't say this when we talked about Shema, but I want to mention it now. The first paragraph of the Shema says, first of all, God is one. We're monotheists, and we explained a little bit what that means in, in Kabbalistic terms. And then it talks about loving God. We spoke about that. And that the words should be on your heart. You should meditate on them. And you should train your children because it's the most precious thing that you have in life. But then I broke off. And I did mention the last two items in the first paragraph of the Shema, which are tefillin and mezuzah. Don't forget the parchments. Don't forget the leather boxes and the leather straps. Don't forget. Don't forget the mezuzah that you put on your doorpost and the gates of your city. No, that's very important. Don't forget. It can feel somewhat anticlimactic. You're talking about monotheism and love and awe and service and willingness to die if, if the Torah requires it of you and being in your heart meditating and training your children and leather boxes and leather straps and parchment. So there are two important ideas here that I want to share with you. There are many, many, many more, but the two I want to share with you. First of all, what's written on those parchments is these paragraphs of the Shema. So what you are doing is creating reminders. By the way, tefillin used to be worn all day long. Some people still do that. If you wear it for a certain minimum amount of time, you have fulfilled the mitzvah so that you haven't violated the command. But the more, the more time you, you wear it, the more mitzvah that you're doing, and the better off you are. So you, you, you wear them yourself, which constrains your behavior in certain ways. You see them on other people, and it's a constant reminder of who you are and what you're doing. When you put it on a doorpost, the doors of a, of a building, uh, the, sorry, the rooms of a building are usually dedicated to function, especially in a house. That's why you have a dining room and a living room, and a bedroom, and because there are different things that are done in the different rooms. When you move from room to room, you're often moving from function to function. Now, there are very holy, pious people who will kiss the mezuzah as they go through the door jam. That's not a bad idea. I'm not telling you you have to do it, but it's not a bad idea. It means, pay attention! You're moving from this function to that function. Pay attention to what the goal is. Focus on what you're doing. So, in a simple sense, these physical items are implements which enable you to focus on the ideas that you've just recited, and therefore they're relevant to the paragraph. That's one idea. There's another idea, which is very characteristic of Judaism and is graded in other Baha'i religions where they have some of this and some have none at all, and that is how seriously do you take the physical world? There are people for whom religion is a matter of intellect, emotion, meditation, your inner life. Your inner life. That's where the soul of the person develops and expresses itself. Religion is about the life of the soul. There is a religion in one of whose texts is written, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. That's an expression of this attitude. There's a physical world out there, a military world, an economic world, that belongs to Caesar. Give it to him. Give it to him. My soul walks in the city of God, outside of this world. Judaism won't have that. We have many, many commandments that interact with the physical world in, specifically, in specific prescribed ways. And the idea is that the physical world has spiritual potential. And that one of our functions in the world is to realize the spiritual potential of the physical world. 
which primarily uh, is focused on the body, your actions should elevate and spiritualize and sanctify the body, but it applies to the rest of the world as well. One way in which this expresses itself, I'm not going to do the depth now, probably because I'm not able to do it well, but one way it expresses itself when you perform a commandment and look at the implications of how the commandment is performed. First of all, the vast majority of commandments are performed by moving your body. So your body moves in this way to act out the will of the Creator. It's your soul that understands the will of the Creator. It's your soul that contains the capacity for free choice. And the body acts it out. That means that the will of the Creator is now embodied in the physical body. Now let's say, for example, you're making Kiddush Friday night. So you're holding a silver cup filled with wine. Ask yourself, where did the wine come from? In the vineyard. And how did it get to your store? Well, first of all, somebody had to create bottles. And there's a, a factory where they where they're bottle. And then there's a tr trucking industry which trucks them to your door. And then that means there have to be roads. And there have to be laws because otherwise nothing will operate without, with, with security. So think of all of the implications. This web of connections that brings the, the wine to your hand. When you make Kiddush with that wine, there's a ripple effect to all of those elements of the world which are involved in enabling you to have that wine. And the cup, the silver of the cup was mined in Mexico and it had to be shipped across borders, which requires tariffs and, and uh, border inspection officials, you know, ice, which is now supposed to be nice. <laughs> National, uh, inter okay, that's a political joke. And, and then there are the, the, the artisans, the, the artists who, who design the, the, the silver. Think of the gigantic, just when you're making Kiddush. That elevates all of the elements in the world because every, you know, when you take the whole system of mitzvahs, everything gets involved. And those who have been with, with, with me from the beginning will remember, I made the point several times, that according to the Ramchal, according to this book, the world to come encompasses everything. Certainly not just the soul, it's the soul and the body, but also the mosquitoes. Everything goes. Nothing is lost. Nothing is in vain. Talk about conservation of energy. This is conservation <laughs> writ large, with no variations for quantum mechanics. Everything is conserved because the activity of human beings in doing mitzvahs elevates and realizes the potential of everything in the world, and then it becomes an, a, an integrated unit, and all of it has a place. Of course, transformed in, 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 uh, in very significant ways, but still, still. You know, uh, you can have a Beethoven symphony, which is sounds carried by airwaves. You have the notations on paper for the, for the notes. The person can hand you a book and say, this is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I said, really? I don't hear anything. Yeah, but it's all written here. Then there's someone who remembers it, so it's coded in the neurons in his brain. Those are three very different ways in which Beethoven's Fifth Symphony can exist in the world. One is on paper, and one is an event taking place in, in, a, in a place which has airwaves. And the third is neural organization of the brain. In some sense, they're all Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So when you think of the differences, we talk about the body and soul and the physical world as a whole, we're talking about being transformed to a position where it could all exist in the world to, the world to come, there will be uh, um, very, very significant transformations. But if you know how the transformations work, you'll be able to say, yeah, this is the guy who ate matzah and he waved a lulav. This is the guy who blew a shofar. And now, through this series of transformations, this is what he has become. And he takes along that identity with its history, and he's, he exists in a different format. But it's still, it's still him. And that's, the true, that's going to be true for the physical world as well. So the fact that the, the first paragraph of Shema ends with very physical implementation of Torah ideas carries a very deep concept. This concept that we are not disconnected from the physical world, that religion, the Jewish religion, is a program for interacting with and elevating 
the physical world as a whole. That's why being a recluse, living in a cave someplace or on a mountaintop and cutting yourself off from the, from the world is not a Jewish ideal. Indeed, indeed when so there were certain medieval religions who practiced that, the, our source like the Kusri and the Rambam and others wrote against it very uh, stringently. Retreating from life, social life, economic life, political life, um, economically creative life is is not a Jewish uh, is not a Jewish ideal. Okay, you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering. Uh, it seems like in the Torah we have a lot of commandments that have to do with remembering, like uh, you just mentioned at the end of Shema, if you remember to put on the boxes and the doorposts. Oh, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to say that there's a specific commandment to remember to, to do those things. I'm just saying the Torah requires you to do it, so you should remember. Yeah. You talk about commandments. There are six, six commandments that are, are remembering. Specifically, of the 613, there are six that tell you to remember something. But of course, if you're going to live out the rest of them correctly, you'd better remember things. But that's not. I wouldn't call it specifically a commandment. It's just you know yourself that you have to be, keep these things in mind. Yeah? Okay. Um, so that's the idea of, of, of tzitzis and tefillin. Oh, so that's what I want. That's what I was going to. So now you have the, the fringes on the end of your garments and the tefillin that you wear. One of the many meanings this has is this is an insignia of your status. There was a time when if you were an official in the court of a king, let's say you were a prime minister, you wore a medallion around your neck. You had a, 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 something holding it, and it was a medallion, which signified your status as prime minister. Uh, the clothes, I remember it's, I was told by uh, a rough that I was very close to in Baltimore, of Taub, and that in Austria, there were two military forces. There was the army, and then there was a group called the Swiss Guard, which guarded the life of the emperor. If you were, so to speak, drafted into the army, you would bribe anybody to get out of it. It was murder, it was, it was hell. Um, if you could bribe somebody to get into the Swiss Guards, oh, you would do it for, and then they had very elaborate uniforms. A person in the Swiss Guards wore his uniform everywhere, because he wants people to know that that's what he is. Um, Clothing, there are two, I would say, fundamental attitudes towards clothing. One is that it's utilitarian, and the other is that it's symbolic. Utilitarian means it keeps you warm, and it uh, protects you from the elements like, like uh, snow and, and wind and rain. Um, symbolic, well, it symbolizes your social status and your economic status. It symbolizes what activity you are going to, you're going to perform. Um, you know very well because of association, when you dress differently, you feel differently. So uh, the fundamental question should be asked, what is the Torah's attitude towards clothes? Is it utilitarian or is it symbolic? Well, here's a very, very interesting law. The Kohanim in the temple have a uniform. They must wear that uniform. If they don't, and they carry out the service, the service is invalid. Now, in our legal texts, the question is raised. It's invalid. What's the definition of the invalidity? Where's the failure? How do you define the failure? And the Gemara says something quite striking. It says, a Kohen without the right uh, uh, garments, without the right uniform, isn't a Kohen. He's a czar. He's a stranger. Which means that the failure is you're the wrong person. That's a radical idea. He's not wearing the right clothes. That means he's not the right person. That means clothes are certainly not just utilitarian. They're not just keeping him warm January in Jerusalem when it can be cold. There's a, oh, that's a wool coat. Wonderful. I'm so happy I have this coat. You know, it keeps me warm. That's not the attitude. Then when you hear about this, the fringes on the garments, on, on corner, garments that have four corners, you say, okay, this is another symbolic expression in clothing. Tefillin are clothing. 
they're a kind of implement that you wear. That has, to, that has a lot to do with the laws of Shabbos. If you wear them in a public place, you're not carrying because it's, 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 it's clothing. So clothing in general has a symbolic value. And then when you see the particular elements that we use on the, on the clothing, you have to ask what the symbolic value is. And I will finish by telling you something which from the Gemara, he mentions it here in the, in the Sefer about tzitzis. So you, you're familiar with these tzitzis and you know that they are deficient because they're supposed to have a blue thread also. Tcheles. Mm-hmm. Now the Mishnah in, in, um, in Menachah says, if you wear all white, you've satisfied the mitzvah. If you wear all blue, you've satisfied the mitzvah. But the ideal mitzvah is to have white and blue. Okay. What's the blue for? So Gemara says, well, the blue of the tcheles, the string, is similar to the blue of the sea which is similar to the blue of the heavens, which is similar to the God's throne of glory. Aha. So when you look at the tcheles, the blue string, you should think of being connected to God's throne of glory. So now, a person who hasn't studied logic will ask, why are you going from A to B to C to D? Why don't you simply tell me that the blue of the thread is similar to God's throne of glory, go straight. But I say I haven't studied logic because from the fact that A is similar to B and B is similar to C and C is similar to D, it does not follow that A is similar to D because the dissimilarities accumulate as you go from stage to stage. And A and D can be very different if you have to have two intermediary stages. The commentators actually say this. So it means you can't get from your thread to God's throne of glory without taking the sea and the sky along with you. You don't leapfrog out. It's another illustration of the theme that I told you about not, not banding in the world. You don't leapfrog when where you are to the top. You go up step by step and you take them along with you. That's the message in the blue of the, uh, of the tres. So you look at that and you say, this is the emblem of what I'm doing. This emblem expresses the fact that I'm taking the whole of the creation and attaching it to the creator. That's something that you have in the blue of the blue thread. So that, the idea of slows being symbolic is a, is, a, um, is a classical Jewish idea. And with this idea, you might be able to explain, at least in part, why we wear the clothes that we do. And I'm talking about Hasidim now and why we're very conservative about clothing. Yes, we are aware, we Hasidim, that Abraham did not dress this way. Mm-hmm. And King David did not dress this way. And in the Talmud, Talmud times, they did not dress this way. We are aware of that. But changed circumstances, since there's no prescribed style of clothes in the Torah, so that's left to adapting to your circumstances so as to maximize your interaction with the Creator. And our clothes are dark, usually black, formal attire. Black, formal attire. Hmm. Where in the secular world do you find black, formal attire? Well, what about judges? Judges sitting on the bench hearing a case. They wear black robes. In England, they had this ridiculous wigs that they wear. I'm not talking about that. But they also wear black robes. And if you ever perform classical music in a serious setting, which I did many times, you wear formal black nightwear. You don't play polo shirts and uh, <laughs> I won't say it. <laughs> you won't wear polo shirts and then, you know, shorts and that sort of thing. You know, ribbons. No. And when you graduate and get a degree, you wear a long black robe and that absolutely ridiculous hat with a tassel, right? What's going on? What's going on is that these activities are very important. They're very important cultural values. Justice, which is the backbone of the whole system. Education. And yes, classical music. The attire expresses the gravity, the centrality, the importance, the meaningfulness of of what's going on. That's a great deal of what this form of dress expresses for us. For us, life 
is like that. It's not just an activity from time to time or place to place. Life is like that. We're expressing that, that, that same idea. Yes, it's, it's, it's time-bound, and it's culturally bound. We're taking this as a value from the people around us. That's true. But again, the Torah didn't prescribe any particular type of clothing except for the, except for the Kohanim. So that's another expression of the symbolism of the clothing here. It's a, it's a symbolism that, by association, has an effect on your whole, you know, who am I? What am I doing? What's going on now? Is this just downtime? Are we killing time? In the famous American expression, English expression, killing time. You know, killing time is temporary suicide. You know, they say time is money. What a tragic mistake. Time is life. Time is all you've got. If you trade time for money, you're making a bad deal. Making a bad deal. Yeah. What would be the relevance then of uh, Yosef's uh, clothing regarding to this? Uh, I don't know in detail, but Joseph, the, the Midrash says that Joseph's life parallels Jacob's life. So Jacob saw Joseph in a certain sense as his successor, as, as the one who's going to represent him in the next generation. And this raises the whole story because the patriarchs, each one of them, saw someone as representing them in the next generation, and it was a mistake. And in the case of Abraham and Isaac, it was the wives who knew better and who took charge of the situation to make sure that the mistake was rectified. So this is a three-generational problem. It's very, very deep. I, I, I'm just telling you all on the surface that that's, that's what's going on. Je Jacob, so that's why he gave him the coat. He's called Ben Skunim, the uh, child of his wisdom, not his old age, because Ben Yomin is younger. So don't tell me he was the, he was the, he was the last child, so he was a child of his old age. No, that's wrong. He, he transmitted his, his wisdom to Joseph, and he wanted him to be seen as, as the one who's carrying the identity, carrying the, carrying the function in the next generation. He's the child from Rachel, whom he wanted to marry. He didn't set out to marry Leah. The other children come from other mothers. There's a whole, a whole business now. Why it has many colors, and why that's the way it's expressed, that I don't know. But, but, but there's a great deal there to be, to be expressed. Okay, have a wonderful Shabbos.